real African stories and real African experiences. This is a Legally Clueless video series. And in this episode, Zipi shares about dealing with grief after losing her mom. So my mom is Dorcas Anyangolali and she passed away on the 3rd of August 2021. After what, I can't even call it a short illness, it was a sudden illness. Like she was okay on Friday. Saturday, we had she was sick, stomach ache. Then she was taken for uh, tests and then an ultrasound, nothing. Uh, on uh, Sunday, the same, they gave her antibiotics, but the doctors said nothing. The, the ultrasound was negative. They couldn't see anything. On Monday, I repeat, she was like, it is increasing so, so much. But then the doctor gave her even like now stronger painkillers because he said, we can't see anything, but I gave you antibiotics on Sunday and the ultrasound is clear again, three days consistent. You don't understand what's happening. But on that Monday, when we talked in the morning, uh, she said, I'll be fine. Just pray for me that she'll, ah, mama, your voice is sounding so distant. She's like, eh, you are so worrisome. I'll be fine. Then I said, okay. But something strange happened. I decided to send my dad money instead of sending my mother. I, I always sent my mom money because we always thought money heal, heals her pain. <laughs> So I looked at what I had on the phone and I said to my dad, instead of my mom, and I don't know why, but it had never happened that instead of her, I sent to the other side. And I called my dad and I said, ah, it's okay. We are trying all we can. She's not even admitted. She was like just going to the hospital and going back home. So on that afternoon, after she had gone home, she slept, she slept. And then she called a friend of hers and told her friend, please call the priest and tell him to come and see me. And the friend called the priest. And the priest said, hey, right now I'm from a mission. I'm so tired, let me see her tomorrow. And the priest called her to tell her that. Then she told the priest, if you come tomorrow, you will not find me. My sister was at home and the priest came and knocked the gate. Our gate is like a while <laughs> from, from where the house is. I think it's around 100 meters from where the house is. So there was no power. And so when he rang the bell, no one could hear. But then my mom woke up from the bedroom and told my sister, the priest is at the gate, go open. And they were like, no one has knocked. And they said, go and open. And when my sister went to open the gate, they found the priest just making a U-turn to go. And they called the priest in. At that moment, they prayed. And my sister says, then they just remember the praying and my mom like feeling very happy and jovial and relaxed. And we talked that night and the following day in the morning, uh, Tuesday morning, I called my sister and asked, how is mama feeling right now? She's like, she's fine. She's just waking up. She's taking some winter beaks. She's going for a shower. Then we are thinking we'd take her to the hospital again. But tonight she kind of like slept more peacefully. In a span of 10 minutes, my sister called again and said she's in the bathroom, but she is not talking. And at that point, I asked I ask her, is she dead? What do you mean she's not talking? She said, in Ulu, they say, doge omoko. And they, I, at that point, I just started crying. I was on my way to Kenyatta University. I had very early morning classes, like at 8 a.m. So that time, I was around Riscos, Ngong Riscos. And at that very moment, I felt like, oh, no, I have to go home, like, now. For reasons I don't understand. Up to now, I asked myself, why didn't I even plan that sudden journey the, the previous day? <clears throat> so I called Jumbo Jet immediately. <laughs> And I asked them, is there a flight? Can I book? They're like, no, you can't book online. If you want a flight right now, you just come and the one you find, you will get in. Like it's, yeah. So I said, okay, let me start driving towards the airport. And I drove. When I reached like Oles Rainy, like 25 minutes later, it is my dad's driver who now called me. And before he said anything, I said, don't tell me my mom is dead. And at that moment, I slowed down. And I felt... An emptiness. At that moment, a friend was shooting along Mombasa Road, 
And I called him and um, he told me to just stop where I was and he sent me a driver who came, picked me, I went to where he was and uh, he took me home. I called all my sisters and brothers who were in Nairobi and told them we are leaving now to go home. If anyone is ready to leave, we are leaving in the next one hour. And we left and we went home and home felt different. Home felt sad. It felt, it felt silent. It felt there's no welcome. But we buried my mother in exactly seven days. She died on third, we buried her on 10th. And uh, I started thinking about the things that she had told us from the year before up to her time of death. I realized my mom had been planning her death. Um, because she had planned so, so much. She had planned so, so much. The last time we had been with her, she took us to her bedroom. And she told us, oh, you know, these, um, the, the, these dishes, you know, these things for catering. Ah, when I die, you take them. You like cooking, you take them. Sally, Sally's my sister. You will take these ones. Uh, and my clothes, you can give them to my sisters. Yeah. And she told her, mm, Kwani, where are you going? And I was like, I know, I'm just talking. You know, death is not something to be feared. That's a year before. This same saved me around me. She tells me, oh, you know, uh, this boy whom we have lived with for so long, even if I die right now, you can't leave him. You have to pay for him to finish his course. I was like, mm, mama, you are the richest woman I know. Where are you going? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm just saying that is not something to be feared. It's just good to talk about these things. And uh, she did, she kept talking about her death like that, like, I'm, when I die, when I die, do this, when I die, do that, to all of us, you know, and uh, even her investments. My mom was rich. By all means and standards, my mom was very rich. <laughs> and uh, she was a business person. She was a teacher by profession. She had done all businesses that there were. She had opened a secretarial course. She had done... Um, uh, business for plastics, like getting them from warehouse and taking them to all markets. She had done food business. And then she built a four-story apartment. And uh, in that four-story apartment for, I think, uh, you can say 10 years, it was a club downstairs and upstairs were offices. Actually, even one of my father's offices are like in one of the rooms. And around 2019, she said she was tired of operating this club business. So she partitioned that one and it was rented out by a gym, a radio station and all. So she said, even that building, I, that one is for my grandchildren, you know. Yes, you, my children, I want you to guys to be together. When I die, people will come from all over and welcome them all. And she kept saying that. And truly, when my mother died, people came from all over. And I say all over, I mean from from like, how do I call it? From the sweeper to the executive. One thing in my mother's death, one of the things that I learned about my mother's death is be selfless, <clears throat> to be very selfless. My mother was a giver. We thought we knew our mother as a giver. But the testimonies that were coming during the seven days of her funeral, I think she was a saint. Uh, I remember there are people who ca came and uh, they would come and say, I just had to talk to you. I know you don't know me. Even your family doesn't know me. But one day I was standing in front of the bank and your mother asked me what was wrong with me. And I told her, my daughter has been called to high school and I don't have 15,000 that they need. My mother went to the ATM, gave that woman $15,000, a woman she didn't know. And that woman came to the funeral just to give that testimony. But that is not all. My mother was educating over, I think at that moment, over 10 children. <laughs> and here we are, sometimes we thought she was broke. <laughs> so we look at her and we're like, where was she getting all this money? But then realized we never lacked. 
as we were growing up, we never lacked anything. There were times when my mother could be broke, my dad could be broke, but then people could come and bring just food. Like, oh, I was passing by, I came to this town, Homer Bay, and I decided to just bring for you this maize. I decided to bring for you uh, these beans and anything. And my mom was like being given and she distributes. And that was her. She was called Dorcas. And if we say anything, I always say, your name, you live according to your name. Yeah, your name is who you are. Dorcas in the Bible is this woman who used to give, uh, make for children uh, clothes. My mom used to make for children clothes to be brought to Tumaini Children's Home here in Madare three times every year. She used to know how to make clothes. So she could put them in a sack and they could be brought to Madare. And now when that priest heard that she was gone, we didn't also know what to do. One thing I also learned during my mother's death is faith. My mother used to say, God loves me so much that if I am to die, he will not allow me to suffer. God will not allow me like to be bedridden, like to be taken where, you know, until all the money that I have made for my generations to be over. And I think that is exactly what happened to her. Like three days of illness, then she went. She went in the most peaceful way, according to my father's words. She didn't struggle to die. Like at that moment of her death, she called my father and my sister, and he le uh, she leaned her head on my dad, and she breathed three times, like someone who's just getting into deep sleep. She didn't struggle with death daily. You know, sometimes we see in movies, you know, people like fighting, fighting. No, she, she just breathed her last. And that's exactly what happened to her. But one thing that came out very clearly was <clears throat> my mother lived her life in the church so, so much. We don't even know when or how because she was all over the place. <laughs> but every day of those days of the funeral and even after the funeral, let me say for the 10 days from the day my mother died, we had a priest coming to give a sermon in our home. A different one, not the same one. And even on the day that she was being buried, even the bishop was supposed to come, but then another priest passed on. And so we had 14 priests in the compound. Out of their own accord, they came and they all wanted to say something. And I looked at this and I wondered how can just a mere woman to ask the children, a mere mother, <laughs> be buried by 14 priests. In my mother's funeral, there was no politics. And we made it very clear. Like I can tell you, we did not even give one person a chance to greet the people as a politician. It was very intentional. It didn't go well with some people, but it was very intentional. Because we said she was already a member of Divine Mercy in Catholic Church, Catholic Women Association. All these priests are here and it's COVID-19 protocols being put here again. We don't want politics. We planned for 500 people. I think according to the number of the chairs, we all the 1,700 chairs were sat on and we had more people standing. And the burial was on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday market day or on a Saturday. And we sit here wondering, maybe there were even 3,000 people. We couldn't control it. But we had told the chief and the police that we are planning for 500, but we cannot control the people. What we're going to do, we are not going to have the main funeral service in the compound, but we cannot control the people. So it's you guys to find a way to control the people because our mother was larger than life. When we went to the town center to get anything, everyone who saw us gave us free, free stuff. Then I felt the power of family. During my mother's funeral, I felt the power of family. You know, sometimes I look back and I say, maybe I should have more children. <laughs> we are seven children. I am the first one. 
And then we have my brother Kabaka, my sister Sally. Sally is the one who was there with my mom when she was dying. And then we have my, my brother also Shikuku, uh, sister, uh, Sheila, and Winnie. We are seven children. And I have never seen us together like that moment. It felt like she was talking to each of us to do things her way. Because she had told us that everything will be fine. You know, funnily enough, the past one year before her death, she kept talking about it. But when someone talks about her death and you are not imagining that she will die soon because she's not sick, then let me say, you become legally clueless <laughs> on how soon that is. And so when that happened, each of us, we had a feeling like, oh, she wanted this, mama said this, mama said this. Because uh, it's very funny, when we were with her some time back, she said, Sally is the one who has lived with me the longest here in the house. So when I die, she will give my neno. Neno is a eulogy. Yeah, she's the one who will give my eulogy. And so even uh, during the family, we were like, oh, Sally, you know, mama had said you'll give her eulogy. So that is sorted. Yeah, it was like that. We gave everyone, like, oh, Winnie, you're the designer. You know, you do this graphic design and stuff. Can you just do the program and stuff? You know, everything was like divided. Akuku is the designer. Go and confirm is the dress that's been made for mama is up to task, you know. And uh, for ZP, I think I'm the event organizer. I never left that compound for the seven days. I'm not talking about that compound. I never left my mom's compound for the seven days. Because it was just like, you wake up, Danny, 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 they call me Danny at home. And it was like, you're here, you're here, you're here, everyone, and you have to greet everyone. And, and it was just like that. And I look at my father, who is... Uh, as emotional as I am. And sometimes we could sit down and we could wonder, like, how come we are feeling stronger than we have never felt? During the seven days, I could sometimes hear her voice. <laughs> Which is, uh, I'm, I always say I'm a very spiritual person. And, and I could hear her voice so, so clear like like she is here and um, whenever there's a day i think on uh, on friday <coughs> i looked at the budget <laughs> the committee had set <laughs> and i looked at my own account because from the collections there was zero and I felt weak. And I went to my mother's room. I sat on her makeup table. On her makeup table, it, there was makeup, uh, these things for the rosary. And I just sat there and I cried. And loudly, like, I can't even imagine. She said, in lure, the bed of my bed. Huh? It will be fine. Relax. Do you know, two hours after that, People started sending money. Imagine, like, I, yeah, I saw that, I was like, what exactly? <laughs> People started sending money. Adele, in three days, we raised money more than our budget. Because of community, because of family togetherness, because of friendships, because of because of selflessness, because uh, of faith. I, I don't even want to try to be even what she was. Because people kept asking, who among us two is going to be like your mother? And I remember during, um, during the funeral, I told them, none of us will be like our mother. And none of us can be like our mother because our mother's selfless giving was not normal. It was, it needed grace. It needed grace. It takes a certain level of grace to give so much to strangers. It is normal to give a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, you know, to thousand strangers. But to give fifteen thousand, twenty thousand to a stranger, it, 
especially for the us in Nairobi. We feel conned. <laughs> we feel really conned. We ask, what am I getting in return? And all that kind of stuff. So for us, I feel like has needed grace. It needs grace. A lot of my brothers and sisters, we are we are very generous. We are very selfless. And these are things we, I think, picked from both my mom and my dad. My parents are well off but very selfless. Our gates from the time we were very young was open to anyone. Anyone like, when I mean anyone, I mean a mad person can walk in and they get tea, like mad. I mean like somebody who's wearing torn and literally like insane, and they will sit near the gate and they will be given tea. We knew that in our family, we were like the seven children, but we lived with like five other cousins and I don't know how many other aunts. And every day we had at least three or four visitors. So breakfast was a big meal. And the one thing that was so significant the last time I went home, a month, exactly a month after having a roll, was the breakfast table was empty. Because we were so used to my mom's breakfast table. Being, my mom has the biggest dining table. <laughs> And it was always full of like, there was tea, there was porridge, there was maybe some avocado or mango juice. There would be like bread, uh, maybe indoma or potatoes or maybe even beans. So the day I went and I saw there was tea and bread only, I cried. <laughs> In my mother's house, it was like heaven, like she had so, so much. She had so, so much, and she gave so, so much, and she got so, so much in return. And I look at back and I say, I, people ask me to be, to, to sit, put myself in her shoes, but I can't. I can't because I'm not her. I believe she is living in me, and I still have my path. And my sisters and brothers have their parts. And sometimes one thing I get people don't realize is that if my mother was helping many people, it is not us to sit in and help people. People need to realize that her children have also lost a parent and she was doing equally much to her children. So sometimes I sit back and ask, can this people tell me who should I go to also? Because... Uh, Just a moment. It's hard. It's, it's very hard. There are things that someone cannot tell you when your mother dies. And maybe people should just get this straight. <laughs> you don't know the pain someone is going through. Even, even as brothers and sisters, my relationship with my mother, my brother's relationship with my mother, each of us' relationship with my mother was different. So it is, it is okay to say, I am sad with you, Zippy, I feel your pain. It is okay to say, I've been through this, you know, so that somebody can feel that compassion. But somebody cannot say, I know exactly what you are going through. Because they don't know. Even my own sister doesn't know. A moment. I hear, I hear her voice. The one thing that's hardest for me is my children. It's hard for them to understand that she's gone forever. But they're coming to terms with death. Like uh, the younger one, if right now I say I have a stomach ache, she gets scared that I'm going to die. Personally, <laughs> I am scared every time of what if I die? What will happen to my children? And uh, that fear kind of paralyzes me. 
And uh, sometimes when I'm passing through a moment, my mother was the one I could just call like, ah, let me just tell her to pray for me. And uh, for a long time, it felt like um, a routine. <laughs> but just, um, oh, should I say last month, I went for an interview. I came back home and I cried. I cried because I didn't have anyone to tell pray for me. And uh, it felt empty. Mm, when people say, you know, your mother is gone, I'm also your mother, it's different. It's different. I couldn't call anyone. And uh, yeah, the interview went on well. <laughs> it went on, I think, really well. But I think those are the moments that paralyzes me. When people say, you're very strong. <laughs> <laughs> when people say, oh, <laughs> when people tell me, Zippy, you're very strong, I look at them like, huh? <laughs> Inside my heart, I like, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You just don't know. <sighs> I think some of the most beautiful things I can say about my mother is that. I can say my mom was very beautiful. She was very beautiful, like even physically, even even just her face dying at 65. <laughs> she was very beautiful. <laughs> then she was also very beautiful inside. Like she had a beautiful, selfless heart, full of courage. She, she, she pioneered a lot of businesses, a lot of groups, and uh, she could be there for you anytime. And for you, I mean anyone. She can stop her business to be there for you. And she opened her doors to everyone. Everyone, I mean, from the low class to the high class, from the leaders to the servants. And, and she was very fashionable. <laughs> My mother's sense of fashion and class was on another level. Yeah, she was a designer. She was, um, she was an event organizer. Like, if we had a family event, if she's not there, we know it will not go well. She was an event organizer. You know, sometimes you go to Shags and you're told if your mother is not in the kitchen, you'll not get food. No, when my mother is there, all the children and everyone know they will get food because she she used to... Let me say, in my mother's house, there were no small sufferias. There were always big sufferias and she used to cook large and big, big fish, lots of meat. Like, I don't remember any time in my mother's house when they cooked less than two kgs of meat. <laughs> Even if everyone has gone and you're just like four people, she said, hey, a visitor can pop in. If a visitor pops in, we can't start cooking again. So she was always like just giving, giving, giving. And when you go to visit her, she had to look for something to give you, whatever it is. And I look back and I say, when, when people say a life well lived, I think she lived a life well lived. And we just love her. At this moment, I just want to say, I mean, if anyone loses their mother or their child or anyone, it's a long journey. And I'm learning from her past. I'm learning from her funeral. And I'm learning just to be her daughter in a different way. And uh, it's not easy. But she'll make it because she was Dorcas. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and she was called Dorcas Anyango. Yeah.
Thanks for watching this episode. Remember, you can catch new Legally Clueless video episodes every Friday and new audio episodes every Monday. 